Hello and welcome to another episode of the Dustin Eric Podcast Show brought to you by Mimosa Networks. Hi, I'm Dustin. And I'm Eric. Today we're on episode number 21, aiming stuff in the right direction. So we're going to give you some advice on how you can get your antennas facing in the right direction. So, um, unbeknownst to myself and my team here, we actually started a new series last week, which is training. So the first few episodes, we're going to talk about uh, just general topics like aiming your antennas, DFS, like we did last week, and some other general topics. And we'll probably get more in-depth into the Mimosa product as we go along here. So uh, we'll go ahead and move along here. Special guest, my team. Hello, team. My sound guy, the director. Welcome. Um, so today's main course is aligning antennas, regardless <coughs> if they are Mimosa or something else. So, of course, antenna aiming. Um, align antennas by adjusting one axis at a time. So, basically, either left or right or up and down first. And you want to complete your uh, left or right or your up and down before you move the other direction. So, what do you normally do, Eric, when you're aligning? Yeah, we, I, I do, uh, and you also want to do it just from one side of the link. Just do one link. Right. Sometimes we use uh, two-way radios because they're instant, like got a fancy Kenwood here, or get your $24 uh, Baofeng uh, and go to Simplex on these things so you can instantly talk to the other end of the link if you're in range. Yeah, I think uh, so, a lot of people out there have Baofengs probably. Oh, okay. So I like, like when I talk to you, I, I say, hey, I'm, I'm going to adjust the, uh, I'm going to adjust the vertical. So stand by. And I, I go and adjust the vertical. I get my RSSI. I'm tuned into the radio. I'm looking at the dashboard, max it out. And I kind of quasi lock the vert down. And then I, then I talk to my other guy on the other link and say, hey, I'm going to go for the horizontal now. And he's probably looking at his dashboard on the other end of the link. So now I'm going to go horizontal, lock it down, and I'm not going to touch it. And then I'm going to turn it over to the other guy on the other side of the link. Go, hey, go ahead and uh, do your side now. And that way you, you peek your side, I peek my side. I might go back, re- do a little re-peek until we're optimized. Right. So you, you never want both right. antennas moving at the same time. Yeah, and that's what we're trying to get you to understand yeah. from what Eric's <clears throat> saying. Right. One person at a time, one direction at a time. Otherwise, you're following your, your RSSI is going all over the place. You're following each other up and down. You, yeah, just do one side and then do the other side. Maybe you go back. So if you're not doing it right or you don't spend enough time doing it, when you're aligning left and right or even up and down, horizontally or vertically, for those that are um, okay with terms like that, um, you might end up on a side lobe if mm-hmm. uh, you get connected. You're just like, okay, I'm done. But right. then you wonder why your signal strength isn't as high as it should be. So what you what would you do? So say you you're you're adjusting. Say I'm going horizontal, and I get I find a peak, and I'm going oh make a note of that. You can even tell the other guy on the other side of the link, or he, and he's looking at his uh, RSSI. But make a mental note of you, the best you got on that horizontal. Right. And then from there, keep it going. Go to the right. Hey, I'm going to the right. Going to the right, and it drops off. Maybe it bumps up a little. It might be a side lobe, and then it really. But try to keep the link. We want that blue light. We want that link going, and then come back to that hot spot, and then go. Okay, that looks good. Now go to the left. I'm going to go to the left. I'm going to drop the RSI lower, lower, lower. Okay, I'm kind of satisfied that the hot spot's the hot spot. Right. Um, and I like to take a sharpie so often and and kind of mark on the whatever mount you've got do a little sharpie tick mark so when i find the hot spot i'll sharpie it that might last for a couple hours or a couple of weeks it'll wash off in the weather but it's good for today so pick it up mark it up and then uh, you have a, a starting point right and this is the same for tilting your antenna as well yeah so vertical adjustment so up and down you do the exact same thing you might end up on a side lobe if you're not doing yeah. the full range of up and down on your radio when yep. you're doing that same for the other end of the link Because you're aiming for the best possible signal you can get. And I know there's tons of people out there, and I'm even guilty of this uh, years ago, where I just get a link, and I was happy. And it worked. Mm -hmm. But uh, most often, you could get much better if you sit there and spend the extra time doing it. We want to minimize uh, errors and and get the max out. I'll tell you about the silo. Uh, up Up in the Arctic, up in the far north, we would run VSAT. A, a, a satellite just to get some data channel, internet channel. 
and we'd had a spectrum analyzer, and you could see the the, the peak of the uh, the amplitude of the the hot signal, and you could see the side lobes above and below that hot signal area. Um, and so you know you're you're going up into the sky, coming back down to get your circuit uh, from somewhere that might be a thousand miles away. So that's super critical. We're looking at point to point here, and and uh, you still have to pay attention to. To the side lobes and the primary lobe, right, and yeah. that's even uh, for point to multi-point clients too. Yeah, right. Although you're usually going to be a lot closer with those, and they shouldn't be so difficult. But you need to take that into consideration for all radios that you're deploying, and not just point to point. Yep. So this next thing here, tips and tricks for easy alignment. So you've already discussed your hand hand radios here, your walkie talkies, <laughs> as some people will call them. Um, so what else do you use to help assist you with aligning? Um, once we've gone over the uh, network design tool or some kind of tool that gives us an, how to point and where to point, here's building A, here's, here's tower A, or whatever, A and B, um, I'll want to know which way to point. So I use a regular uh, compass, or if you use your smartphone and you use the compass app, now you gotta, you got to watch a lot of the, this is, this is, uh, uses magnetic north, this guy, and this smartphone uses magnetic or true north. So what we see on the design tools are true north. So if you're using your smartphone and there's no other metal obstructions and you, you're confident there, you might actually pull a, a regular $15 compass out in your smart device and see if they're in the ballpark on magnetic and magnetic and see if they're there. Right. But and you'll have to go back to true north because it, most of the map tools are on true north, and that could be a, a 12, 14 degrees difference. So. Well, uh, in point-to-point -point radios, uh, when you're in aiming tool mode, mm -hmm. That's also true north. Yep. So yep. true north is what you should be sticking right. with. So, so just, if you're using one of the old school compass, you, you're going to have to, for your latitude, wherever you're at, you're in Europe, you're in North America, you'll have to adjust a few degrees for your declination right. to, to make this thing, uh, to, to show you where true north is so it jives with your map tool. So also, I like to use the design tool or Google Earth plot out the link, and look for landmarks that'll yeah. help me at least aim the antenna rough alignment to get those linked up so we can do our fine-tuning aligning, which we were just talking about earlier. Um, also, Eric, you use binoculars a lot, too. So here's some little 8x24s. These come in handy. Uh, here's a range-finding uh, one, but don't, don't really need that. This is only good for a couple hundred meters, but uh, yeah. this one. Um, we found we had a... I don't know, 14 mile, 10 gig link out here in Silicon Valley. And we got the binoculars out and we, we thought, hey, is there some obstruct, Fresnel obstruction that didn't show up in the maps? Mm -hmm. And sure enough, there's a giant pine tree uh, a third of the way over of that, uh, you know, the 10 miles out. And we, so we grabbed, the, uh, comp grabbed the, the binoculars and we could see this monster pine out there. And we were like, you know, just still peeking the signal and right. just skirting that tree. That's funny that you talk about that. We're going to go through that in just a minute. I'll bet you have a slide. Uh, maybe. Like so <laughs> we're going to get into why does my signal suck? I've tried to align my link for many, many hours, and I can't get a better signal. It must be because product XYZ sucks, and you suck, and I hate it. Thanks for wasting my time and money. So, <laughs> yeah, lots of people think that way, but just sit back and relax for a few minutes because there's a lot of different reasons why you might not be able to get to the signal level that you're supposed to see. Mm. So you need to at least go through those troubleshooting steps before you just assume that the product is bad. So we're going to talk a little bit about that now. So the first thing is the antenna that you have. Um, it could be that you have too low of an antenna gain for the link distance you have. Um, it might have a really bad uh, front-to-side ratio, so you're picking mm -hmm. up a lot of noise from other antennas that you're co-located with. And also, Oper there's one more reason. Uh, operating bandwidth of right. the antenna, what is it designed for, frequency-wise? So a real common thing that we okay. see is, is people using, uh, say, a ubiquity dish that only works between 5.1 mm -hmm. and 5.9, okay. but they're using 4.9 gigahertz yeah. or they're using 6.4 gigahertz, and they're wondering, why Why is my signal so bad? Mm -hmm. So we ask them, what dish are you using? Yep. And they tell us, and we're like, the dish doesn't operate optimally or at all in those signal level ranges. Yeah, it, 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 you usually fall off those design parameters on a 
parabolic reflector pretty tight, and and that performance will just drop off. Right. And tr- you, here you are at five eight. 5850 and you and then you know we'll get a we'll get a call or a chat and the guys uh, down in brazil at it's at, at 6.2 or 6.3 or something and then we'll we'll go right for the uh, we'll qualify them hey what what are you using right yeah so so the next thing is until antenna polarization so if you go and you put up a horizontal vertical dish and you've got it facing one way and then somebody on the other end puts up a dish and they have the feed horn or something turned like 45 degrees or 60 mm-hmm. degrees off then you're going to have an issue with uh your signal strength then yeah you can you can lose uh two three four plus uh db because your your two antennas are misaligned or out of phase right they're off they need to be at microwave you know above a gig to 2.4 5 10, wherever you're operating at uh they're going to need to be right on and the higher you go the, the, the better be that that, that, that signal's got to be tight. So the good thing up. about Mimosa radios, though, if you're 90 degrees off, it, it's auto-correcting in our software. But there's a lot of radios out there that don't auto-correct. Mm-hmm. And even if you're off at a weird angle, I don't even think that Mimosa can really uh, adjust for something like that real well. So you're still going to have that loss yeah, you were just talking some, about. I think the, the guys that write the code and stuff, the engineers are, have got that stuff some of that worked into the code, so it, it helps out. Right. Yeah, yeah. But, so and that goes, how about my, uh, B, I got a B5C, and I've got a couple of A5C, and I've got the the coaxes coming out, and, and we could do some of this, too, with the coaxes, right? uh, or B5C, and, and the, it'll adjust for right. if they're mixed a little bit, if, if your yeah. inputs are, are wrong. The B5C uh, and the B5C. C5C will all yeah. auto-correct for that. So. Not the A5C. Excuse me, but right. the B5C. Yeah. B5C, C5C. Yep. So the next slide here is about Fresnel zone and Fresnel zone clearance. So we, of course, would rather you have 100% Fresnel zone clearance. Uh, this could, uh, Fresnel zone obstructions can be caused by trees, buildings, or just anything in the path of your two radios. Um, 20% obstruction is okay. Uh, you don't want to go any more than 40% obstruction on your link. Um, anything more than that, you're really going to have clipping from your errors through. You're going to have lots of errors, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it's going to cause a lot of packet retransmissions, higher latency, packet loss, uh, and just a poor connection. Those uh, those deciduous trees that lose their leaves at the fall, or what's going to happen next uh, April and May when they start blooming up, and, and you're looking at microwave and the, and the, so those wavelengths start to see that that foliage size and uh, it might be. Might uh, right. have some obstruction. There, that's you know, that's so a very common issue, that, especially yeah. for uh, point the multi point clients installing yep. them on a house. Yeah. You've got clear line of sight, but you're shooting through a tree with no leaves. Yeah. Um, newer installers who aren't familiar with this technology, they don't think about that. But then you come around to April, you know, March, April, May, and they're like, hey, the signal strength has dropped 10, 15, 20 dB. What happened? They go back out, and it's shooting right through a, a thick tree. Yeah. So well, we we see guys look. So you're up on a fourth floor building with your your antenna here, and uh, we'll, we'll come into uh, chat or have a question for us. And they've got that they've got that uh, non penetrating roof mount or some kind of aperture, some kind of mount, and it's way back it, it, uh, it, it, beyond the edge of the building. So it's way over here, back at you know 40, 60, 80 feet. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we and then we ask them, hey. You have enough cat six, or do you, do you have enough to move that forward closer to the edge of the building? Because some of this uh, Fresnel is obstructed by the parapet or the overhang uh, uh, at yep. the edge of your local building. Mm-hmm. So that's something to, big time to look at too. Okay, and another yeah. thing that a lot of people don't consider is co-location interference. And what I mean by that is when you have multiple radios on the same roof or same tower, that are transmitting and receiving at the same time, but they can hear each other when when they're receiving. Receive, so yep. so when they send out, nothing's wrong because the remote radios can't hear each other. But coming back, mm-hmm. the the sending radios can kind of hear what the receiving radios are now sending to them. So you want to make sure that you have enough space. Channel with, separations right, and physical... Physical separation between the radios because... You have to think about the the antenna pattern of the radio you're putting up. How wide is that? 
So like the B5 being an integrated radio, you have quite a big antenna lobe right there when it's transmitting out from it. Yeah, and can you go back to the previous sure. with that? So that's this pair and that pair. What about other operators and other five, let's say five gig, other five gig devices that are out here in the field uh, beyond uh, these two, uh, say, uh, APs or, or, or stations? They're out here. This stuff is, is seeing a lot of that too. There's a lot of, it's competing field. Right. So, yeah. So you're just going to have a lot of uh, co-channel yeah. interference to deal with yep, too. Yep. Mm -hmm. So these next pictures, if you're watching, uh, if you're not watching, it just describes uh, putting up multiple B5s with their antenna patterns. And with a B5 in particular, you can have four per tower on the same channel without them interfering with each other. But you have to have them spaced enough where you don't have to worry about it. So if you're watching, this is uh, four antenna patterns uh, over on one point that are facing away from each other. So in this particular example, we have one pointing at zero degrees, one at 85, one at 165, and one at 245 for max maximum performance. So with B24, because the it's only like a three, de three oh, degree width. beam width, yeah. you can have many, many more Okay. on the tower instead of just four. So it just depends on up. what frequency you're using too because as your frequency increases, your antenna pattern is going to shrink. shrink. Yeah. So 60 gig, it's like my <clears throat> finger. So it's very narrow beam width. Um, and another common thing is for point oh. to multipoint, it's common channel client interference to multiple access points. So for those of you that are doing micro pops or thinking about doing micro pops, this could be something that ends up being an issue for you. You just have to be conscious of it. So say you have a client that is associated with um, an access point that's in line with another access point. If it transmits and receives in the direction of the two APs, uh, this results in interference for the access point on the far right when the client transmits and the interference for the client when the far access point transmits. This interference shows up on each radio's respective analyzer. So... Mm -hmm. One thing that you could do is change the frequency on one of the APs. Or you could aim your client at another AP that's off in a different direction so it's not causing interference. Um, there's a lot of times people come in the chat that have this problem who are doing micro pops, so they just need to be conscious of the spectrum that they're using and the direction their clients mm -hmm. are facing to help reduce or uh, remove uh, common channel client interference completely from their network. That's one of the nice things about the tool, the uh, spectrum analyzer tool on all the, the radios. You right. Know, you can get a general picture. And you can combine combine station AP data for an overlay. Yeah. yeah. So do you have anything else that you want to suggest or talk about before we end the show? Uh, I, th I think anything that's... That uh, we didn't miss anything? I don't know. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay. Make sure the firmware is the same on both. <laughs> that's next week's podcast number 75 or 76. Wow, that's, or that's a lot of additional podcasts. Oh, yeah. All right, guys. Well, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And uh, we'll see you on the next episode of the Dustin Eric Podcast Show. All right. Bye. Better well. well. Thanks for tuning in. Please hit the subscribe or follow button to stay up to date with our latest podcast which will be available on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and SoundCloud.